Welcome to another episode of the Victory Podcast, driven by Audi. I'm your host, Keely Orr, joined by my co-host and former USC defender, Dion Bailey. In person, live in studio. Dion, I'm so excited to have you in person. 3D, no delay. Yeah, definitely. No technical difficulties this week, so it's exciting to be here, be able to have a professional setting and really get to <laughs> really, really get the podcast feel. So excited to talk some ball this week uh, and uh, excited to be doing it on campus. Is it weird being back? I was talking to you beforehand. You haven't seen the like updated Heritage Hall, which is now a decade old. <laughs> I have not. I've seen videos of it, so it's exciting to be back in and see all the upgrades and uh, all the new bells and whistles that you guys have here in the uh, <laughs> athletic uh, facilities now. So it's exciting to see the athletic department being able to really uh, not say take care of the athletes now because we were taken care of when I was here as well. Yeah. But really, you know, just get to shower the athletes in uh, you know nice little shiny things like every other athletic department is doing across the country so it's exciting to see it's so amazing to not have a delay either like the uh, yeah, fact that we're definitely. talking right now together I, and i know everyone's like get over it but like <laughs> we've had like multiple multiple podcasts just you know having technical difficulties you and, and the audio problems that we've tried to navigate through so very excited to have you and i know i'll probably say this all throughout this episode but like i said very excited to have you is it weird like feeling like you're not on a screen. You're like 3D. <laughs> it is a little bit, you know, make sure thinking about what I do with my arms, <laughs> and my moving too much and things like that. But it's exciting to be actually in a real studio in a professional setting. So now it feels like I'm really podcasting now. So you are. I mean, you always were. But I, you was, I was. We were. We were. But this is uh, this is pretty cool. Well, the fun thing, too, is that you actually got to see the game in person and not mm -hmm. just watch it on tape. You were there live. First off, I just want to get your overall thoughts about being there in the Coliseum. You were there last year for certain games, but you were back here for this 2023 roster. What did mm -hmm. you like to, to see this team in person? Uh, it was. It's, I like to see the team in person relative to seeing them on TV because the angles and everything of the camera can add some pounds, make guys look bigger than what they really are. Yeah. So I like to see them and size them up against their opponents. And the team look good. They look like they got, uh, I wouldn't say better athletes, but better looking athletes. They look like, you know, just filled out more, a lot bigger, a lot, look a lot stronger. And uh, you turn on the tape, they look like they, they moving faster, playing more decisive. So they definitely turned over the roster again. Mm -hmm. And it uh, looks like they took it a step further this year. That's what I took away from seeing the 2023 team compared to the 2022 team. Well, like I've said for the million time, very excited that you got to see the team in person and glad to have you in person for the show. Uh, before we jump into it, just a couple of reminders. If you're enjoying the show, please be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, please be sure to subscribe as well. Um, if you ever want to get your voice heard, if you have a question for Dion or Cody, uh, be sure to follow us on our socials, Victory Pod USC, Twitter and Instagram. That's where we uh, either put out a question tweet or a question box. And we ask four questions for Dion on Saturday. Saturday, Sundays, depending on when I get that out, <laughs> and then Tuesdays for Cody. So if you ever want a specific question uh, to be answered by uh, the two gentlemen who are my co-hosts, be sure to follow us there. One last thing before we get into your thoughts, Dion, just want to give a thanks to Audi. Performance is more exhilarating on a real road. Introducing the Audi Q5. Visit your SoCal Audi dealers, proud sponsors of the USC Trojans. And you can also take your health to the next level with Symbiotica. They're premium, easy-to-take supplements, fuel your body with key vitamins and minerals, to help you reach peak performance on and off the field. Elevate your health today by going to symbiotica.com and use code FIDON for 15% off site wide. All righty, Dion, like I mentioned, 66 to 14, USC took care of business. Coincidentally, the same score as the Rice game from last season. So it's interesting doing re recaps like for these games just because it's like yeah it's it's what we expected usc handled business but i was just curious your overall thoughts from saturday's game yeah that's exactly what you wanted to want uh to be the situation when you take away from a game like this or going into a game you're playing against somebody you know you're uh superior to talent wise and uh really i mean physically it just not talent but just physical physique as well for the most part so you expect to go out there and dominate your opponent so to speak so to see them go out there and handle business and uh really yeah 66 14 but that first touchdown they gave up i mean it, you could really say it was 66 7 because i mean i put damani in that position nine times out of ten and he'll make a play on that ball so they just that one 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 situation he didn't make a play they got a big play then they was able to get in there the first drive and then they really shut him out all the way to the end of the game so 
it was a great showing by the team what we wanted to see because coming in last year you never really knew what you was going to see no, no matter what opponent was on the field with us so it was good to see us uh really just play our game and not play down to our opponent. Now, I don't know if this is correct, but I would assume that Nevada is a lesser opponent than San Jose State. So do you... I would, say, I would agree. Okay, so how do you gauge game one to game two? Can you do that? Because it's like, yeah, of course they look better when you're going from a lesser opponent. So how do you gauge what you saw on Saturday in that sense? You're really looking to see the fundamentals taken care of. Tackling, just alignment, assignment guys just doing the right thing and making the plays that they're in position to make so that's what we didn't do against san jose state even though we really uh defensively specifically i'm speaking of we they played a good game they really they tackled well they were where they were they were in the position to make the plays but they just didn't make the plays consistently enough to where they they gave up you know five or six plays and those plays allowed san jose state to put points on the board the amount that they did it wasn't like they were just methodically moving the ball up and down the field, which seemed to be the case last year. And that's where turnovers really turned the tide for our defense last mm -hmm. year. We really couldn't stop anyone in between the 20s. So 20 to 20, they go up and down the field. But then once they get in the red zone, somehow we would end up making a play. And that's, that's how point, yeah. we were able to win some some drives on the defense end to give our offense the opportunity. They, keep, they score 40, 50, and that's how we would come up on the winning side. So it, it was good to see that not be the case. And it was really just a couple explosive plays, just things you can clean up coming from week one to week two that seemed like they did clean up besides that first drive they had the explosive play but besides that it wasn't really any bust out there and didn't really see guys not be where they're supposed to be and not make the plays they had the opportunity to make so that's what I was excited to see coming from week one to week two even though the opponent may have been to a certain degree like lesser of an opponent. Okay, interesting. Now, I just want to go into the defense because, of course, we always get defensive questions the most yeah. on Sundays. Now, when it comes to that Damani Jackson play, it was interesting because I believe it was like the second play of the yeah. game, right? Mm -hmm. And it was just a go ball. Is mm -hmm. that something that they saw on film where they wanted to test Damani? Or is that just they got lucky with that play call? I feel like uh, our secondary, excluding our safeties, are they're young. And they're, they don't have as – I mean, Wright has a lot of experience, but he was a rotational guy last yeah. year. Uh, him and uh, really anyone opposite of black men, they rotated. So they, uh, they're not proven, so to speak. So – Early on, a lot of the opposing offenses are going to try them. So I don't think that's really like oh, watching the tape from game one and saying, oh, we're going to pick on number one. It's just, you know, he's young. He hasn't played, so we're going to make him prove it. Like, it doesn't matter if he was a five-star coming out. He got to prove he's a five-star yeah. in college. So I think that was really his welcome to college moment to where, for me, it was super encouraging because him – being a, a superstar really probably his whole life and then coming in, you know, getting hurt and then starting off last week. I mean, it probably didn't go the way he wanted it to go and then start this game off. He get beat with the play. He's right there in position, but he doesn't make the play and he doesn't fold. He doesn't get down on himself. And you see him really pick up his play throughout the game, finishing plays, like excellent finishes throughout the game where you don't see young DBs. He didn't he doesn't panic when the ball's in the air. So I was really encouraged by him, you know, not things not going his way early in the game, but him recovering really well. He had uh, two or three nice pass deflections, real late finishes. It looked like the receiver's going to catch it. He get late hands in there and knock it out. Real uh, just just calm and confident when the ball is in the air, not panicking. So that's a good sign for, for a DB because he's going to be in this conference in a position where the ball's going to be in the air coming his way a lot coming up in this season. So you need him to be comfortable in that position. It looks like he he's getting comfortable. For someone who's never played in a defense before, I, I feel like it's hard because, you know, the average fan is like, he yeah. messed up, get him out of there. Can yeah. you explain, like, it's that's kind of you you live and die like that as a corner, right? You do. And it's uh, as a corner, you're in a lot of un like not normal positioning. Like the whole position is like playing receiver but backwards. So, like, the just the movements and the positions that you're being to to make big plays or just make plays at the position period you just need repetition you need to be in that position be have the opportunity to make that play so then you get more comfortable being in that position and it just feels more natural like you're not thinking it's just a reaction so it, it it's nice to be a great athlete but to play db being an athlete it just enhances your ability to play db but you still need to know how to play db though you can't just throw an athlete out there and think he's going to be able to just jump around and make plays and all that at receiver, yeah, because they're going forward. But DB, you're going backwards. So the movements and everything is technique, it's repetition, and it's just being in that position, getting the experience, getting comfortable. And that's what our secondary 
spe- specifically Domani is going through right now. And and we knew coming in that, you know, it, there might be some growing pains, specifically mm-hmm. with Domani, who's basically this is his rookie season. Exactly. This is just what comes with the territory, right? I mean, like, exactly. I feel like people don't know how to judge when, you know, you have DBs out there when they're young. How do you judge a, a good performance by a DB? Uh, for me, it's how they react to bad things, things not going their way, because things are not going to always go your way, especially in this conference where they're throwing the ball 30, 40, up to 50 times a game. Like, offense is going to win some reps. Like, it's all about how you respond. So to see how they're they're not taking one play over to the next. They're really taking it play by play, and they're trying to really hone in their technique. And what I've been encouraged about from Domani and including Wright, they, they've been in position. Like, every rep that they've been a part of where it wasn't a bust, they be in position to make the play. Now, whether they make that play or not, that's something they just have to have more reps in, being in that position where they get more comfortable and more confident that they can make that play. That's uh, where I see their game take going to the next level. But uh, as a young DB, to answer your question, how you would judge, it all depends on knowing the scheme. Like for Damani, we run a lot of man on third down. So you're seeing him on an island, whereas mm-hmm. younger corners on other teams, defense coordinators might try to hide them. You know, like put them in a lot of zone or roll the covers to their side. So you don't really see them on that island where they can be exposed, where we're trying to build the money up to be uh, like the number one corner is what it seems like. A lot of men putting them on the island, just, hey, you're on the island, you're going to sink or you're going to drown. One or the other, sink or swim, uh, so to speak. So he's really just going through that that learning phase. They're building them out. He's building that foundation. And... uh, from week one to week two, I'm encouraged by his development and how he's progressing. In that sense, what's a fair, for, for both Wright and, and Damani, what's a fair uh, timeline to put them on as far as growth and expecting, you know, to be locked down, if you will, quote, unquote? I don't think it's a timeline. It's just really uh, just depending on the opponent in the moment. So just like when okay. it's time for you to be at that level we need you at just hopefully when that moment arrives you're ready to for that moment so it's not like oh you need to be locked down by Oregon week or Washington week like sure. you never know maybe next week he, yeah next week may be the week we need him to just take on the challenge maybe we don't see foresee going into the Stanford week where he's gonna have to take 10 targets coming his way he's gonna have to win eight or nine of them yeah. you know what I mean so yeah. we'll see it's not really something I don't think you can put a timetable on but it's Time is definitely the clock sped up. Yeah. For sure. Like yeah. <laughs> uh these two weeks were definitely like building block weeks and weeks to really build your confidence and just get experience being in posi- certain positions, being in uh, certain situations and things like that so you can be confident enough to come through once you you're playing against elevated talent across from you. So I, I, I it's not a specific date or game I think that they need to you know be at their best but it's definitely a speeding up and as we see other teams around the country it may be coming faster than what we expect so it's a uh, but it's exciting to see that the uh, trajectory of their pro- his progress specifically and including right that they're on right now they're they improve from week one to week two and that's all you can ask for yeah I, it seemed like last week you were a little bit um hesitant about USC's defensive backs. How do you feel as a whole about them in, in game two now that you've seen more? Uh, I like I like the way they they, they got better uh, just not allowing uh, any misalignments and busts. Like, so last week I feel like they were exposed. They just had some busts in. Uh, San Jose State was able to capitalize on that. So the explosive plays they had, it wasn't somebody getting beat. It was only it was one time Wright got beat, but it was an excellent throw and catch. Like, it wasn't. Like it was no, uh, no, uh, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but no <laughs> slight of the uh, of the actual off the receiver making a play it was a great play. So yeah. I wouldn't say that was you know a talent thing or anything like that. So they they got better and they didn't have any mental laps. Like so that was encouraging. That's really what you're looking for going against a team you're superior to or you think you're superior to. So that's uh really what. I, why well, I'm way more encouraged coming out of week two than I was week one. Now, the wild part about Saturday that I wasn't expecting was USC's inside linebackers. First off, Mason Cobb and Eric Gentry were not dressed out. Mm-hmm. Um, that was something where, you know, you have the initial warm-ups where guys are in, like, sweats and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, they're kind of casual during warm-ups. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, wait, they're not they're not doing things. So uh, Lincoln Riley gave an update after the game so that they both were not ready to go on Saturday so that, okay. that they don't think it's something long-term. 
Um, and, and Lincoln said, you know, it wasn't the opponent, um, but said that they weren't ready to go. So we'll see what happens heading into Stanford week. But uh, because of that, we saw Taka Curtis get his second start, uh, but also Rajon Davis, mm-hmm. I believe, get his first start as a Trojan. So I was just curious what you saw from the first that iteration of USC's in li- inside linebackers and then we can get into what happened later on in the game <laughs> yeah definitely first of all, I was surprised to see uh both uh uh Gentry and uh Cobb not suiting up you know but because they they rotated so much last week and obviously a lot of us know about uh Davis uh just looming in the back we, <laughs> you know just just biting at the uh, waiting to get an opportunity so it was good that I feel like it just gave them opportunity to build their depth you know early yeah. on in the season where it's not truly i don't want to make slight of nevada but like it's a good opportunity to get yeah. young guys out there and it wasn't making, dire it, you know so it wasn't like we were going into the pacto championship and yeah your two other older veteran guys are down so it was a good uh you know it was a way to turn lemons into lemonade type situation and i think that uh specifically davis that's exactly what he did. He went out there and he proved that he deserves to get more snaps. Uh, definitely throughout uh, throughout the season, I feel like he is a uh, he has an understanding of what he's seeing. So mm-hmm. like the difference from him and uh, like a younger linebacker is Curtis. Curtis is out there. He's just like a like fine ball get ball type thing. Like he he has no pre snap. Uh, recognition and no post snap recognition re- either which is what I took away coming from game one to game two for him is he didn't progress in that aspect of it like he's still not recognizing mm. what what the offense is trying to do to him so what he's struggling with right now is in a mesh concept specifically when it's a tight stack so when I say that is two receivers the number two receivers on the ball the number one receiver which is the furthest outside receiver he's off the ball but they're about less than four yards from the end of the line of scrimmage and the running backs to their side so that puts three and two really close together which is in my day we would call it a jordan scenario which two and three just means two and three is together so you're alerting the person that may have say the the guy that's over the uh, stack may be the flat defender or the hook defender so you're noted alerting him that his Number two, which is showing as number two right now, may become number three, and number two may be number three may become number two. So he's not recognizing the offense putting him in that position. So he's not understanding like who's passing what in the zone concept or who what man he's taking in a man concept where you that's where you see the running back coming free on a wheel or in a mesh concept they run in that the underneath mesh and someone popping up open because they really haven't got on the same boat. Uh, the linebackers and the DBs as well, like either they're going to pass it off or be on opposite levels, let someone run the shoot and someone come over the top type deal. So it's just things like that, recognizing that so he can put himself in a better position to where he's not out of position and he can make a play, like be in position to make a play at least. So like for me, you may not be able to watch film, but what you want to see a player be able to do is take a play that someone ran from him in the, against him in the first quarter and it worked and recognize that play in the third quarter when they run it you mm-hmm. know and, and he's not there yet so I think that I'm, I'm hopeful that the coaches are emphasizing that to him because he has the physical ability like he can run to the ball he has the want to 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 have the pursuit and get to the ball and get guys down but he just has to hone in on the mental side to give himself the best of uh opportunity or give himself the ability to put his best foot forward and show all the ability that he has yeah which in that sense we'll just get into now the targeting he was yeah. ejected for it. And I asked you pre-show, so I already know your answer, but that was classic targeting, correct? Classic, classic. And it's just a young player, you know, trying to make a play, running around, just moving 1,000 miles an hour, or, you know, just take your target down yeah. a little bit. You still get the same effects, same same big hit, same ooze and all, but you get to play the next play, yeah. you know? So it's just a learning learning opportunity for him. And, and thankfully for him, it was in the first half, so it's not going to affect him next week, so... He could take it. He was able to watch, and I think it it was good, in my opinion, for him to see someone with experience like Shane Lee be able to get out there because he's more athletic than Shane Lee, which I understand the dynamic of what's going on in the linebacker room right now. It's not a knock on Shane's ability to play at all. It's just some people are more athletically gifted than others, and it's not much you can do about that. But he was able to put his mental uh, – his really just uh, his mental – Acuity? Yeah. Really. Ability? Just yeah, just like his his knowledge of the game yeah. 
he really is able to display it this week. He he made plays that is not that Curtis can't make them, but he's he's put, not there. He, yet. he sees it. He's recognizing things. He recognizes what uh, the offense is trying to do to him. So he's able to put himself in a position to overcome maybe his athletic def- deficits, so to speak. Sure. To be able to still put himself in position to make a play. You know whether he makes it or not. He did on Saturday. Yeah, I mean where, the first play he came in. Yeah, yeah. So he was, I mean, he was instant impact, and uh, throughout the game, he just had a bunch of splash plays. He seemed like he was always around the ball. So I was super excited for Lee. Uh, on another topic, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think that that's uh, really what I hope that they're they're pushing on him to start recognizing things like under, yeah, understand uh, different formations, understanding. Like, it was one play specifically early on, the uh, fullbacks away from him, and he's so worried that he has this B-gap right here, but he doesn't understand that. Like, if the fullback, like, crosses across, you have to turn that back. Like, even if he goes outside of the uh, of the uh, DN, like, you have to stay outside so they get outflanked, and it's just, it's just a small example of just understanding what you're seeing. Like, mm. you're not just understanding what I have to do in the defense, but understand what the how the offense is attacking the defense we're in. You know, so yeah. that that's really where he'll get to go from being just a good athletic player to being like a great football player. And the reason I brought up the ejection was because in that sense, he missed v- probably valuable pl- he did. game reps in that sense, which is unfortunate because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure from your experience, Dion, that's where he can start to really gain mm-hmm. that knowledge. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And in the position where... He's in a position where he can build his confidence. He's going to win a lot of the reps that he's taking. So yeah. you you would want him to to get those reps back. Those are precious learning reps. But you got to learn from, in, especially in college football, where they eject you for the the target. Yeah. And that, yeah. rather get him get that lesson now than come to find out he's the best guy on the defense, and then he gets thrown out in a serious sure. game because he's never sure. been put in that position. Never really had to learn from it. So it's a. On, on, from my perspective, it was a win-win for the team. They didn't really need him out there, and yeah. he got put in a position which is an uncomfortable one, uncomfortable one, and one that no defender wants to be in. So hopefully, he learns from this, and uh, we don't see any further ejections from him. That play was such a classic tacket play in my mind, solely because that's how he first like made the introduction to me at practice. Because if you rewatch the play, he's near the line of scrimmage that was moved back like five yards. Mm-hmm. The plays. 10 yards ahead of where he is and there's yeah. two USC defenders already making the play and he comes out of nowhere like he's not even in the camera angle yeah. he just flies in and makes that play which that's what makes Tackett tack it but you kind of had to just like you know take it down a notch lower the shoulders you know exactly, something like that exactly he's see ball get ball right yeah. now moving at a thousand miles an hour which I mean is what you don't want to have to teach yeah. so at least now you can you rather have to not necessarily rein them in but like get them locked in or get them really honed in on, on a particular thing then really have to try and rev a guy up, get him fired sure. up to run around. Like So him coming with that aspect to his game is definitely a positive. That's the one thing you never want to have to coach a guy on. So now you just really got to just, just sharpen his tools and, and uh, help him develop uh, really an understanding of how he can use his abilities in the best manner to help the defense. Well, Given everything you just talked about, you talked about Ray John, you talked about Shane Lee, you talked about uh, Tackett, and then we know what Eric and Mason can do for the mm-hmm. most part. What does USC do now now that they've seen so many of their inside linebackers play well? In my opinion, uh, Ray John is the one that needs to be on the field because he brings the most diversity. Like, I see what they're trying to do with Gentry, but Ray John can actually do it. Like, mm-hmm. when I saw him rush on Saturday, I didn't know he can rush the passer. <laughs> like, he was full on, like, putting a move on a guard, rushing a passer. Like, it looked like a front four, but Ray John is lined up in a two-point stand over the guard. I'm like, I, I never seen him do that before. I didn't know he can even do that. So that that really got me excited where they can have on the third down, they can really have, like, a, like a cheetah package where they bring in all fast rush guys and they can, without rushing, uh, adding a fifth or sixth rusher, get to the passer. Like, they had, it was... It was um it was Solomon it was uh Davis and then Bear uh, and then it was Lucas on the other side which you can substitute Lucas or Muhammad I feel like they both can give you the same effect yeah and let those four guys get after it like it, on the third down so it was exciting that was the first time I saw that I'm not sure if they've done that before I don't know uh, yeah I'm not sure if they've done that before I know Gentry he'll mug over the guard and center but he always drops out 
Yeah. But he, it was a full on like rush. Like they took the D tackle. It was a dime package. What uh, they take the they took out the nose tackle, brought in a six DB, and they left Rajon in, and he rushed. So I was just I was I never seen that before, and it was exciting to see because now I'm seeing uh, maybe Coach Grinch really he really didn't have the guys to do what he's trying to do. So mm-hmm. like now I feel like he's getting more confident, trying to dig in his bag a little different, a little yeah. deeper. And uh, he's going to, I feel like he's going to have guys in, in uh, great positions this year and give them the opportunity to do some things that we haven't seen them do, which is going to be more valuable for them in the future. Well, in that sense, is there now a problem that you opened the door with Ray John Davis? It's not a problem. It's a, it's a, it's embarrassment of riches, if you will, it's, but it's a great position to be in a great position. Do you, I am <laughs> i don't know. I'm, I'm pro Ray John Davis, but how do you, how I'm do you... not sure. Cause I, I was with the rotation thing, but that was going into week one. I haven't, I hadn't had a chance to see the, the new clock rule get taken into effect. So yeah. now I don't know if there's enough series out there to rotate how, we've been doing it so yeah i don't know that's the pickle that they're going to be in because now it's literally like every possession really it, it really matters, it really matters like, yeah. yeah you're not going to get a just a whole bunch i oh, will get them next time type deal or yeah. like you get this count snap count you get that snap count it, i don't think they can do that so i don't know it's a good position to be in there <laughs> and uh a lot of them are young excluding Cobb. so it's uh, great that they have the depth, and then they hopefully they're building the confidence within that depth to where they feel like any guy that's out there, they're confident to call the same defense, run the same scheme, and those guys be able to effectively run it. So it's a position I feel like our defense hasn't been in it, especially yeah. last year and, yeah. and years prior. So it's exciting that uh, you know the recruiting and everything is starting to take hold. Five sacks on the night for USC. What did you see overall just from the pressure that USC was able to create? Again, the front four, the, the guys they have rotating in, I mean, you can go from, I mean, list any of them. They all look great. Even the, the young guy, Joey, he he looks great. Uh, they brought in the freshman, 34. I forget his name that had the sack fumble at the end. Oh, uh, Shelby. Braylon Shelby, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I've seen him before, but he looked good. He didn't look like a freshman. Like He just looks like he's a, a guy behind a, a stable of older guys ahead of him, which yeah. is a great position to be in. That's how you're a good team. Like You have to have guys who look like guys, but they're just waiting in the stable because you just have a plethora of guys. Yeah. That's how good programs are, the Alabamas, the Georgias, and it. Back in the Pete days, that's how you sustain greatness. You just got to have that competitive edge at every position. And I feel like that's what you're seeing from the D-line because that is, to me, this year, which was, the, is to me, the complete opposite of last year. Yeah. They're the strength of the defense. Like, the front is the strength. I include the, the stand-up outside linebackers and DN yeah. Same yeah. with the D-line. So, they're the strength. So, I think that this is a, it's a good thing. And they can rotate. So, it's it's, it's a good thing that we're we're yeah. deep in that in that uh in that part of our defense. So I think we're built this year to have a better defense because the front is better. Can you get away like if you were to like a, a lesser of e- evils, you would rather have a more fierce front, right? Than than Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, cuz the the back end really it feeds off the front. Like yeah, you can have a great back end but it just makes them have to work that much harder if they're not getting pressure from the front. Yeah. They're having to cover longer and really just be be great, be amazing, really make amazing plays because yeah. it's hard when uh, if it's the offense isn't doing the timing thing and they got the Caleb Williams thing going on, they're running around and all that. It's like yeah. you're at a lose-lose. Like, so <laughs> for the, the it works well when the front's able to put pressure on. The quarterback has to get it out fast. So now you're not really – you are you can believe in what you're seeing if you believe it's going to be a slant. You know this quarterback only has two or three seconds. So if I guess on a slant and I'm wrong, he's either going to get sacked or he's going to throw me the ball. You know, it's not yeah. enough time for him to be running – the receivers are running double moves or just deep routes. They Everybody going deep, running different things. So we covering for a long time. So I think that they, uh, once the DBs get more comfortable and start making more plays that want, while they're in a position to make those plays, you'll see it all start coming together because the front looks great. They're putting pressure every snap. They're collapsing the pocket. They may not be getting home as much as the pressure they're putting on, but, like, they look good, specifically <laughs> Bear. I was about to say Bear is as Bear, advertised. He, man, as advertised, like I, I just it's, college football is so weird to me because like you just don't see. I'm not used to seeing transfers be guys. Like back in the day when you right. transfer, it was for a reason. You know, yeah. like yeah. you couldn't play there, so it was like That's a good you point. either went down. Well, you you had to go down because we had to sit out a year. So yeah, like, <laughs> back in your yeah, day. Back in my <laughs> day. So like you, 
I just, I really never saw guys go from one school to another, excluding Silas Red, who came from Penn State to here. But they, that it's really like, were guys. Instantly like, produced. Instantly produced. Like, why are, why did you transfer? Like, how you weren't playing at your old school type yeah. deal? Yeah, yeah. And uh, he's uh, that guy. I'm like, hold on. Like, Bear doesn't look like he didn't go down in a step in competition. So that's not a thing. And he just, I, I'm i shocked. Like, <laughs> it, that was a steal. I think that was, that turned the tide for the defense, getting a win like that up front, a guy that can look the part and actually deliver too. So yeah. that was huge. Are you more shocked by Bear Alexander or Jameel Muhammad? Muhammad because <laughs> Bear came from Georgia. Sure. So I'm it like. It was half a joke when I asked that, but yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. But uh, Muhammad, I'm still in awe that he ended up at Georgia State just specifically because recruiting is not necessarily about what you're doing in high school. It's about what they project you as. Yeah. And he looks like a guy. Like like coming off the bus, he looks like a guy. So yeah. I would assume somebody would take a swing on him type yeah. deal. So it's just I'm amazed that even with him at quarterback, people – play all kind of positions in high school all the time and people able to project them at the proper position. Yeah. And I'm just surprised that a guy like that was missed after seeing him two weeks in, like, hold on, okay, <laughs> he's a guy. Like, I don't <laughs> understand how he got on his path that he was on, but thankfully he ended up here. <laughs> yeah, guys, it's a good thing for USC that for people sure. missed him. Definitely. As far as just, like, some of the other guys, Anthony Lucas, 99, uh, Jack Sullivan, what did you see from them as well? Um, I saw them still applying pressure, playing with great effort, and uh, just looking like the all, the front just seems like they're tied on the string right now. Mm. They're all they're rushing together. It's not like you're seeing one guy just out there doing his own thing. It seems like they they all have a plan and they're all like executing on it, the, and they're all like, celebrating each other. It doesn't seem like anybody is you know has a selfish mindset about about their their rush opportunities. So that's always a positive. And uh, specifically for Lucas, he's young, so yeah, he's having. I'm a, I, I guess you could call it success, even though he doesn't have, like, sacks, all a bunch of different sacks and whatnot. But he's, he's playing well. He's making plays when given the opportunity. He's rushing well. And uh, it's a huge confidence builder because he has, like, ability that you can't teach. So yeah. once you get that confidence on his side, I feel like his the sky's the limit for him. So to have a, a young guy in the mix with a lot of older guys, him, Bear, that's the best part about our our front. Like we're young too. Like I forget that Bear's young. He's young. He was a freshman last year. Right? It's insane. Yeah, I think yes, so. Yeah, I believe he was a freshman last year. Like this is really, and he ain't really playing to the playoffs last year. Yeah. So like this is really his first go around at it. Like his real. He's a a guy. He's getting real snaps, meaningful snaps, consistently. And I mean, his draft stock has to be through the roof. Like, he's just a game changer. Like he legit is. Like he like when I see him on tape, he reminds me of Leo. Like guy that just wow. sticks out. Like yeah. oh yeah, yeah. like oh, ninety looks different. Like he's pushing guys around. He's throwing guys around. Like it looks like you know, in high school what a guy, a five star looks like <laughs> in sure. high school. That's sure. what it looks like when he's out there right now. Yeah. And it's not like a couple plays. Like he's bringing it every snap, which is what you don't see from a lot of big guys. You know, they don't have the stamina to do it. Yeah. But he's, he's collapsing the pocket every snap he's out there. So it's super exciting to see that from him. And the wild part, too, is that he didn't come till late in the summer for mm -hmm. USC and then was dealing with some injury issues. Mm -hmm. So even in camp, he was limited to a certain degree. This is like this is bear on the fly playing right now, yeah, so, which I'm, is wild. I'm pretty sure the coaches really truly didn't even know what they had because, you know, he didn't really get that much exposure at Georgia. You saw him get a couple – splash plays in the national championship when he was given the opportunity so you know they really just okay he was a five-star we recruited him back when he was at Oklahoma he went to Georgia so fingers crossed that he pans out and he's panning out so yeah hey that's part of recruiting you know just taking a taking a swing and hopefully that you hit the ball and yeah. they definitely <laughs> knocked it out the park with Bear so hopefully he can continue his uh elite level of play so far in the season on the rest of the year we have a lot of defensive questions. So one final defensive point from me. Uh, I feel like Lincoln Riley summed it up best last night. He said, football's more fun when big people score. Uh, I didn't definitely did not have Stanley Tafu as uh, on my bingo card for USC's first defensive touchdown, but it was yeah. just so exciting to see him get his moment as a redshirt senior. Yeah, definitely. You always like to see a big fella get to touch the paint. <laughs> and it's, it's exciting for the SC defense on the night where they really suffocated an offense. And I feel like they played their best game. 
as a unit under Grinch, uh, even though it's a lot of different guys, but just a Grinch led unit, it looked it looked good last night. And uh, for them to get that that first turnover, I mean, they almost had it last year, last week when Solomon had the sack fumble, but the San Jose State was able to recover. For them to to he almost had another one this week too. Yeah, actually, so uh, for them to actually you know get on that turnover, be able and then to be able to turn it into points. Hopefully, you know, it, it just gets that, that turnover bug going, hopefully. and Because we know that it's there. They, yeah. they, whatever they preaching, whatever they practicing, it works. Because last year, there's no way that was a fluke. It was way too many, and it was too consistent. Like, yeah. It wasn't just like one or two games. They had six, seven. But it was just like, so the philosophy and the, the practices to execute that philosophy is there. So hopefully it just picks up. And then once a defense that's aligning better, uh, executing their assignments better, and uh, just, I mean – so to speak, have better players, they uh they get that turnover bug going too. I mean, they could turn into an elite defense, and then if you get an elite defense to complement this elite offense led by Caleb Williams, then I I mean it could be it could be special. So so hopefully that's that's the way we're going. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I saw some chatter on Twitter that was like, oh well, we haven't seen the same turnovers from USC's defense so far this season. Must have been a fluke last year. What's your take on that? Um, I just felt like we needed them last year. So, like, guys were really honing in on, all right, we don't make a play. We're never going to stop an opposing offense. So, and we were just waiting on them. Like, those were the differences in games. Like, yeah. if we didn't get them turnovers, then we we didn't. The game would come down to, to a nail biter. Caleb have to do something. So, we're not in that position right now. Like, the, off the opposing offense is punting. So like we yeah, I feel like we've seen as many punts in the first two games we probably saw all last year. Like I don't know about not that. Not literally, but <laughs> okay. like like they like actually the the offense is punting. Like sure. we're getting the punt return team is getting out Three there. Nows. So yeah. the turnovers aren't as dire to our defense succeeding. So yeah. I feel like that it has been the change and guys just we just haven't taken advantage of opportunities we've had. Like, yeah, that's fair. Delmani's dropped some. Sure. Um we didn't get on Solomon's two sack fumbles. You know, the ball just hasn't bounced our way given the opportunity, but we have been disruptive. We have had caused opportunities to cause, create turnovers. We just haven't fallen on them and come up with them. So yeah. if you look at it from a half a glass high full perspective, sure. like they're still getting the ball out. They're still being opportunistic. We just haven't, the ball just hasn't bounced our way yet. So hopefully we can keep getting these opportunities, keep being opportunists and getting the ball out, and eventually we fall on some of those sack fumbles. We catch some of those interceptions. So hopefully that picks up. Now over to USC's offense. I mean, I feel like we could just be like, the offense is great again. Let's go to questions. But <laughs> <laughs> over 600 yards of total offense for USC. Mm -hmm. uh, five touchdowns by Caleb Williams. He was 18 of 24 for 319 yards. Miller Moss got into the game again, getting great uh, game reps mm -hmm. under his belt. He also had a touchdown himself with 7 of 10 for 134 yards. Um, 14 Trojans caught a pass on Saturday. Uh, Marshawn Lloyd looked like the Marshawn Lloyd we saw last spring. Mm -hmm. uh, overall, just great things from USC's offense. <laughs> yeah, definitely. They look like they uh, just picked up where they left off last week. And uh, I was excited to see Lloyd because, I, like I said last week, I didn't watch South Carolina, so I didn't really know yeah. what he's going to bring to the table. But, man, he runs hard. He's patient. He's always falling forward. Like, he's he's like a pro back. Like, he just always, his momentum is always carrying him towards the towards the uh, the marker, the first down marker. So that's something you always want to see. He had, he's real light on his feet. It seems like he's running un, out of control, but he's always in control. So, like, some of the moves, it may seem like, oh, he's just falling around out there. But he got, like, just excellent feet. He's like a dancing bear, even though he's not huge. But, like, <laughs> that's how he kind of runs, and he's faster than, than you expect. So he's able to turn the corner and hit the corner, hit the edge on some of those runs. So... And he catch the ball out of backfield, obviously, if you didn't know. But <laughs> so he he's he's showing me that he's much more of a more complete back than I expected. Uh so it was it was good to see him uh show up and uh really get to put his talents on display to to prove that uh, cause we already know Austin. Yeah. He you know, he's a complete back. He can come through when we need him. So it was good to see, you know, that we have another guy that at an elite level can come through when we need it was interesting, too, because he spoke earlier in the week about how he just knew in the first half of last week's game he was just pressing. He was mm -hmm. like, I wasn't I wasn't patient. I wasn't just playing like myself. And he actually said that Cliff Kingsbury was the one who came up to him at half and was like, 
take a deep breath. Like we, yeah. we know, we know what you can do and it, this is not it basically. And so yeah. he said, and I asked him after the game, like what adjustments did you make? And he was like, honestly, I just listened to coaching and, and tried to be myself this time. Mm -hmm, definitely. Cause, uh, you know, when you're in a position, it's a lot of, what do you do for me now? And, uh, the window is so small on being a football player. Everybody focuses on that. Like, I need to do as much as possible right now. Like, every opportunity, you got to maximize it, maximize it. But it's really just understanding, like, what what mindset and what uh, environment you execute the best in. So, like, not letting outside just the, the atmosphere or the pressure of trying to be successful, make it to the NFL, put yourself in the best position. Like you can't think about too much when you think Monty Kiffin, our old, my defense coordinator, my first couple of years here, he's always say, when you see a lot, you see a little, when you see mm -hmm. a little, you see everything. Okay. So you got to make the main thing, the main thing, yeah. you know, stay in the now, you know? So when you, when you're in that mindset, you're never pressing because it's never, the moment's never too big. You're never thinking about too much. So you're just taking everything, one step at a time. And I feel like that's really how he was running. He wasn't trying to score every run, you mm -hmm. know, just every run. I want to make it a positive run. You know, I want to take advantage of whatever the defense is giving me. So I'm not pressing. I'm not trying to beat the old line into the block. I'm not trying to get there right now. I'm trying to, you know, really execute the, the play that's called. And that's why you turn the tape on. He looks so patient and whatnot. He's really just, you know, trying to allow the offense to work for him and then let his ability take over then. And that's what the best backs do, in my opinion. What have you seen from Quentin Joyner? He had a 47-yard touchdown on Saturday, his first as a Trojan, so mm -hmm. congrats to him. But the coaches have been high on him since spring. What have you seen from him in his game? Yeah, he's more he got that more of a jitterbug effect to him. He's a lot quicker, a lot fast, straight line, fast guy, house call. He uh, is just young, and he's behind, you know, obviously two veteran, yeah. solid stud running backs. So, He's in a good position. He can learn guys that have uh, a lot, ton of experience, especially Jones and well, and Lloyd coming from different uh, environments, different playbooks and just schematics and just being able to talk ball and bounce uh, ideas and just different uh, positions he could be in off those guys. He's in a great learning uh, position. And we all know he has the ability that you've seen it. I'm sure the coach has seen it plenty of times in, in practice. So it's about just understanding who I have and, and blitz pickup, things like that. Yeah. So w once you're out there, the the OC and uh, – well, which is, so to speak, Coach Riley. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's confident to call the same plays, run the same scheme. He's not – the playbook doesn't get minimized when you get out there. Yeah. That's really what you want. You want to be a guy – as a young guy, your goal should be by the end of the year that the coach feels confident enough to call any play. Like even if they haven't called it since four weeks before that, you know, because yeah. that's, that's how it is especially at the next level. Like, you may run a play in camp and you don't run it until week nine, but you don't hear about it either. It's not like you're practicing every single week. Just week nine, they call it in the moment, and you can't pull it from the back of your mind, then that's a bust right there. And that's a wild. Guaranteed that opposing quarterback could be Tom Brady. They're going to see it. They're going to find it. So, like, that's really – you have to be that locked in to the fundamentals of the defense to yeah. even if you may not really know specifically what you have, you know, okay, we're calling the fire zone or we're calling – it's cover four, it's cover six. So you understand what's going on around you. So you have an idea at least of where you're supposed to be, what you're supposed to be doing. You know, so that's just the mental battle of it. But <laughs> That's wild. Sorry, hold on. Now I got to take us off on stage. <laughs> it, is that something you've experienced where, like, in camp you run this play and then week nine that happens? Like, Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, they'll call it. My experience is a little different because it's never like I came in, I was the guy like I was in college and it went through the season as the guy. So, like, I... <laughs> I had an experience. I got I got let go by Seattle when Cam decided to come back week three. Then I got claimed by the Jets. We played in London that week. So oh my gosh. I flew out from Seattle on Monday to New York. And then Tuesday night we went from New York to – no, Wednesday morning we went from New York to London. So trying to just learn all the plays and everything. So, like, something they taught me that week, they called two weeks later when I got thrown out there against the Patriots playing against Tom Brady. <laughs> oh, my and gosh. I, and, and that name of that play was the exact same call for cover four for Seattle. <gasps> so, like, I had to play that game. Like, they literally had the same name for different play calls, and I was, like, a week or two removed, you know? So it's oh like, my gosh, Dion. oh, my gosh, yeah. That's, that's just part of being in the NFL. Like, that that happens where you go from one team, then you play in the next week, and they can have multiple plays with the same name, but it could be two completely different things. So you're like, oh, I got to 
flush out what I just learned for the past two years and like try to remember that don't that play don't mean that no more type oh deal. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so that's how you, difficult. How did you sure. go about studying that quickly? Like you were had to cram, I'm sure. Uh I was definitely cramming, but I also wasn't expecting to play either. Because uh, okay. I came from Seattle. I mean, Earl and Cam, they never came out. Yeah. Then when I went to New York, everybody was telling me, uh, my guy Calvin Pryor used to always get hurt. So the backup will always go in. And I never believed him. I'm like, what? Like, I came, like, Cam Earl ain't never came out. What you talking about? Backup? What? Nah, we play special teams. It's the backup <laughs> in the DB room here. But he went down, and then uh, I was out there in London. I played, like, the whole second half. Like, I was on the team for, like, three days. Oh, my God. Yeah, I'm out there busting stuff like crazy because they calling things, and I'm running what we did in Seattle. Oh, my but, God. So it, it was definitely it's definitely a learning experience for sure. Oh, so, my goodness. Uh, yeah, to be it. But then, like, you hear a lot of different terminology. And as a, a pro player, it becomes an advantage because you just heard a lot of things. So you get familiar, say you get moved around. And it's not like I'm, I am I got to learn the terminology all over again. I just got to connect the dots. Like, I've heard it before. It, it means this now. Wow. Like the, it's like speaking a language. It is. It's exactly And then going to, it like, a similar language. That's exactly wow. what it is. That's exactly what it is. That's wild. So, yeah. So I'm sure, like, uh, Jones and Lloyd, they went through that, I'm sure. Yeah. Like, really, especially for offense. Offense is on a whole nother level because oh, yeah. off, calling offense just off the rip is ridiculous. It's like speaking <laughs> gibberish. Like, <laughs> and I understand how, well, in my day when they used to huddle and call it all play and everything. <laughs> back in your day, Back yes. in my day, they don't do that in college no more. They still do it in the pros, so to speak. But it'd be a whole sentence, X, right, Y, jet. <laughs> like, how do you even remember it? 100, 200 of those. Cody like. Cody did an example, and, like, you know that gift where, like, the numbers are coming out of your head? Yes. That was me when yes. he was giving me an example. It's yes. wild. It is wild. I, I give, man, kudos whenever I talk to a quarterback that actually can run an offense, call the plays and all that. I'm like, I don't know what y'all studying looks like, but I don't <laughs> want no part of that. <laughs> I don't want no part of having to remember a whole sentence, like, 200 times, like, 200 sentences. Like, what? Yeah. No. Wild. wild but i'm proud of you you were able to connect it back to austin jones and oh, Marshawn yeah, lloyd yeah, yeah, i yeah, i wasn't yeah, even there but yeah. well done uh i feel like taj washington has slowly become a very clutch receiver for usc he had 75 yards on the night with two touchdowns and coming into the season i feel like one of the talking points was like jordan addison left usc doesn't have a number one receiver mm -hmm. but so far they've been spreading the ball around so much that does it really matter at this point that they don't have a number one quote unquote target? I don't think it does. And uh, they're so uh, talented, so gifted in that position room specifically that I don't think it's, it's necessary to really concentrate on one guy on feeding one guy in particular, the ball. I mean, yeah. maybe Zachariah. I mean, maybe, yeah. I mean, he is, if I had to choose one guy out the room, that was different. It would be him, but sure. it's a room full of guys that are uh, different from a lot of guys, <laughs> so to speak. So I think that that's the biggest difference, and it's it's year two in the scheme. So you're not really searching for a star or someone to really lean on. I feel like last year was a lot of unknowns. Caleb and uh, Jordan were really more so Jordan than Caleb was like the one sure thing of the offense. He was the proven one. He already won a Blitnikoff. So yeah. I feel like they kind of leaned on him to be that guy. But they don't. They're not in the need for that this year. I feel like they're really just uh, spreading it around, letting using everybody for what their their best attribute is, what they do best, and uh, just capitalizing on that. They're not trying to ask guys to do things that they may not excel in. Sure. So everybody's kind of you know being used for what they do well, and that's why you're seeing so many guys get rotated and so many guys touching the ball and things like that. They're really just. I feel like Coach Riley. He's putting on, you know, like his his experience hat now. He's he's preparing the team for further down the road. He's not just trying to win these games right now. That's what it really he's feels building like right now. Yeah, yeah and, and we talked about it last week, like just in the sense of how they rotated so many guys, mm -hmm. and that was kind of their takeaway when we talked to them this week. They were like, "We're not really." It, I'm reading the tea leaves here, but like, it seemed like they were not playing to impress in these two wins correct they're playing to get valuable game reps for everyone so that they can make a deep run later correct. in the season correct because they they know injuries are going to happen and just unforeseen things like like curse getting ejected things like sure. that so when, when uh 
what I would call sudden change situation. You got to have a guy go out there that maybe is not taking significant reps every week. You have to be confident that he can do the job yeah. at an elite level that the guy that was ahead of him was able to do the job at. And uh, he's, you know, he was a part of OU and was winning there, had a lot of success. So he understands what it takes to make that deep run. And it's really depth. Like, who do you have at the end? Yeah. You know, who and I feel like they're they're building right now. They're taking the right approach, especially with the, the schedule we were dealt with because it's not like he, you know, built this schedule. Sure. Or had a say in it. So it's not like we came out and we had, you know, whoever week one where it was right now we have to be our best, you know, pull out our best tricks. We got to yeah. win this game type yeah. deal. So they're able to build, able to rotate, get a lot of guys out there, see a lot of guys on tape, get a feel for who is who. Who do we want to take the, you know, the 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 hold of whatever position, so to speak? So that's a that's what you're seeing. They're building right now. They're they're building a team for a deep run. To your point earlier about the wide receivers, I thought Brendan Rice had a had a good quote about it. Uh, he said, "This group of wide receivers is special. Anyone can eat at any given moment. Mm-hmm. What's even crazier is that any of these guys could be the number one receiver at any other school, and we're all together. Yeah. So it seems like such a good, uh, based on his obviously his tweet, but it, it seems like a good environment that they have where it's not like guys vying for to be the guys. They all can eat together. Yeah, definitely, it's a good dynamic they have going on in that room where they understand it's not a a, a me thing but a we thing. Like if we're all elite, like obviously, not obviously, but excuse me, um, it can actually like cover up some weaknesses of other guys. Sure. You know? So like if you're not being exposed to do more things, you can really show what you're good at. So what you're putting on tape is only what you what you excel at. So you're looking yeah. great every rep that you're out there. So it's it's really a thing that can help all of them really really just hunker down on whatever they excel at and be great at that and not try to be good at a lot of things and be great at whatever they're being asked to do. And uh, that's going to help them all in the end. And uh, everyone knows that they're all talented. It's not like people don't know the room is supremely talented. So they don't yeah. have to worry about people at the next level, like wondering, oh, can he do this? Or it, they already know, like it's already like a unspoken word about the receiver room here. Like, yeah. yeah, you're yeah. in the receiver room right now that you can play. Like yeah. even if you're not taking the field at all, they think that like, you at least could be a number two somewhere else. Like that's sure. just the which I feel like that's been like the thing at USC. Yeah, yeah, too. no, no, definitely. Like uh, for I mean, since my time here, since Keith and Woody started it going after yeah. we had that little drought after Steve Smith and uh, Dwayne Jerry. It's been consistent like that. We got one or two guys who are really dudes. They go on, they get drafted, they play in the NFL, things like that. So yeah, it's a good room to be a part of when you're not like out there every snap, getting every opportunity to show what you can do. What mm-hmm. you don't need. They are also blessed blessed to have Caleb. Like if you gonna get ten snaps, but one of them snaps is one of Caleb's plays. <laughs> that play is played a hundred million times. The Brendan Rice touchdown. You know, you're he's <laughs> gonna be on TV for the next. I mean, that play is gonna surpass next week and the week after. That's gonna be a highlight. They're gonna play it throughout the whole year. So y- your name, just that recognition is always there. So all it takes is you going out there in front of a scout, running a good forty. All that. Oh, I remember he was on this. <laughs> yeah, day. he made this play. Type yeah, thing. the name and everything like it's familiar. So. It's, they're really just in a good position to be. It's great to be a receiver at SC right now. Yeah, one of my final takeaways, I guess, from USC's offense in the last two games is that, and this is also part of the Caleb Williams effect, but you mm-hmm. can never count this offense out of a play. Oh no, it's insane. It I mean, is. the Taj play from mm-hmm. the last first game, mm-hmm. then the Dorian Singer play. Um, I believe it was the first quarter, mm-hmm. and then like we just mentioned, the Bren- the Brendan Rice touchdown. You just can't give up. Like, it's just, I feel like it's so demoralizing for defenses. <laughs> it is, it is. And uh, I don't know what they're doing. They say they practice this thing where it's called the Caleb pocket thing or whatever. He has to stay in the pocket and the receivers run around and whatnot. But it seems like the the offense, the spill skill guys, they have a good feel of when Caleb is running around. They're not just standing around. I feel like last year it was a lot of instances where he was doing his magic, but it wasn't tied on the string with the receivers. So mm-hmm. at the end he ended up having to throw it away or he – we end up getting tripped up trying to just run past to get a couple yards and whatnot. I feel like the receivers, they're moving along with him. They're all tied on a string, which is how you're seeing the the singer catch. Like, yeah. he ain't just stopped and just was wondering, like, oh, is he going to try to run for it? Is he going to just throw it away? Like, nah, he took it up. All right, we'll see if Caleb could throw it because we've seen him doing it a million times in practice. I'm sure that's what yeah. they're saying. Same thing with Brandon Rice. Like, you see him, they're doing 
like not traditional things like scramble drill things. Yeah. I mean, These he was are, on the opposite yeah, side of it. Yeah. So. This is all repetition and just being with Caleb in practice and understanding how he operates. Like, yeah, he's not eluding guy, evading guys and trying to turn into Michael Vick and run. Like, no, he's just trying to buy time to find a guy. So they all, they're all tied on the string. And I mean, <laughs> I still to this day don't understand how he is so hard to tackle. But Caleb, he, when he's in the pocket, it's like he's 6'5", 250. Because like, <laughs> No one could get him down. Even if they get a clean shot on him, he he just somehow he gets away. And I don't know. It's a knack he has, and everybody understands it. Like, no matter what it looks like back there, <laughs> just keep doing your job because he's going to figure out a way, and I better be ready once he, he gets away and he can get his eyes up. You know, I'm I'm where I'm. Just, he's expecting me to be type deal. Well, Malcolm Epps, who was a tight end last year for USC, had this funny quote that I remember. He was like, Caleb doesn't – lift like one of those sissy quarterbacks he was like Caleb oh, really? gets in there and lifts oh, like yeah I so I think it. he I, I think believe it. okay he has a strong okay. base okay that um, makes sense then yeah okay. so apparently the, the weight room is where he he makes his money in that oh, sense <laughs> okay okay makes more sense then yeah got a nice anchor to him because man I'm like I because obviously you go to the next level is quarterbacks are huge like in NFL they're huge but in college you can you can pay against some pip squeaks and Caleb sure. doesn't look huge out there but no one can ever he's Ten guys got to jump on him to get him down for a sack. So I was just wondering, like, how is he so strong? How is he doing this? <laughs> but it makes sense if he in there squatting the world. Yeah, yeah. Squats and stubbornness, I think, are the two <laughs> that work for him in that regard. Um, but any other thoughts about USC's offense before we jump into some questions? Uh, no, just hopefully they can keep on the trajectory that they've been on since last year. And, uh, you know, knock on wood, health is on their side. And uh, I feel like we'll keep seeing the same show we've been seeing. Yeah. All righty. Well, before we jump into questions, just want to give a thanks to Audi. What if there was a portal to the future? Enter the fully electric Audi Q4 e-tron with an advanced touchscreen infotainment system. The future awaits. Also, thanks to Ralph's at Ralph's. Everyone wins when it comes to saving big because when you order online through the Ralph's app, you get the same great prices, deals and rewards on pickup or delivery that you do in store. So no matter how you shop, you always say big at Ralph's. Ralph's fresh for everyone. Fight on. All righty, Dion. <laughs> Keeping a straight face through those ad reads. You're lucky I didn't ask you to do one because Cody was like, I can do an ad read uh, uh, this past week. Mm -mm. Uh, it took him a couple tries. Yeah, I was like, mm -mm. <laughs> no, mm -mm. no, I'm, you got it. You I'm got sparing it. you from that one. <laughs> All righty, first question is from Eddie on Insta. He said, the team played great. What was the difference in the rush lanes this week? I feel like that was a, a big difference from going from uh, like Cobb and uh, Curtis out there to having Davis and Lee out there. There, there are more guys that use their hands when they're taking blocks, so they're not like trying to beat blocks with speed or trying to like shoot gaps to win, which creates rush lanes if you don't win, mm. if you don't get the ball carried down. So I feel like that was the biggest difference from week one to week two. Our linebackers were just fitting the runs better and just not uh, creating rush lanes while they're trying to attack their gap that they own. Like so, not eliminating themselves from the play is what I call it. So if I have the B gap. And I just run through the B gap, but the running back's not running the ball to the B gap. All I'm doing is eliminating myself from the play. Like, yeah, I took my gap, but the ball's not going there. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So I feel like we had less of that going on this week where guys were, were keeping themselves available to make a play on the ball. Like, yeah, I take the guard on. I, I got my hands on them. I may have my helmet in my gap, but if the running back bounces it outside, then I can get off the block and make a play on the ball type deal. So – Feel like that that was a huge uh, difference from week one to week two. Um, J O on Twitter said, "Do you think Rajon Davis will get more snaps on defense going forward?" Definitely, I feel like the coaches. This is just something that they won't be able to put off put off much longer. Is just letting him loose. Really, I feel like he's the best uh, play recognition guy we have out there. He understands what what's going on, what the offense is trying to do to him, and he recognizes seeing it one time, then they run it again. Like, oh, okay, yeah, I see what's coming. I'm able to put myself in position to make the play. I, and just obviously seeing it live, it, I didn't really get to analyze it like that of close person, but then going home and rewatching it, he really jumps off the tape. He is always around the ball. He's never out of position which means he understands what the offense is trying to do. Or he understands, even if he doesn't understand completely what they're trying to do, he understands the defense enough to understand what the weaknesses are of the defense and what like are tough situations he can be in and how to cheat it to put himself in a better position to come out on top of that situation, to, to be able to make a play even in a tough situation in whatever defense. 
and he uh he's fast, he's strong, and he can rush. I didn't know he can rush the passer. I'm not talking about blitz. He can rush, like line up on the D line and rush, rush a guard, rush a tackle. Like that's something. I feel like you see Gentry, who's six six. You want him to be able to do that. Yeah. But his frame is just not there yet. He yeah. still has to develop to be what I think they're trying to use him as, like Jamie Collins, what he was for the Patriots, just a, a specimen, six six. But Jamie's like two fifty. You know, so he can rush the passer. He can sure. drop back. He's athletic enough to cover just different things. That special unicorn piece that they want Gentry to be. I feel like uh, Davis can give us that now, even though it's not in the frame. That That's ideal, ideally for what they want him to do. But mm -hmm. when I saw them come out in that rush package, with, with the dime package of what it is, they're taking out the nose tackle and bringing in another DB and that one of the linebackers is just stepping in to rush for that that nose tackle, which was Davis. And they were, I mean, they were collapsing the pocket. I mean, it's not like Nevada had their backup guys in. I mean, he was in there, he's beating their guard, like whooping them. I'm like, <laughs> like this is, like, the guard knows I have him. You know, yeah. he's on foot on the line, and he's winning. So, like, that's special to be able to do that, like, and be able to play off the ball. So, like, I feel like he's just proven that he's just too valuable of a piece given the opportunity that he deserves more opportunities to prove not prove but just to make plays because i feel like he's proven enough that he should be out there so hopefully he's able to to grasp more snaps it's crazy because in, in the timeline where cobb and gentry are healthy do we even have this discussion about rajon davis and what he can do for this defense i i don't think so because those snaps he got are their snaps you know yeah. so it was it was a great opportunity for him to just and for the coaches to really see it because it's, it's different to see it against at the end of a game, like we're a big against somebody. Like you're out there against the opposing team starters, like, you know, zero to zero. What does it look like for a guy? And he looked like he belonged. Yeah. And that's what you want to see. And he's young. So it's like that, uh, just he's like a foundation building block, you know, like someone that can help us now, but also we can lean on for the future, you know, to help groom the team to, to like last, the success to be lasting, not just like a lighting in the bottle type thing. So, I feel like he's a, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? But he's a super important player for the defense's future. Like, mm, not just yeah. the present, but the future as well. Because Cobb's going to be gone next year. Like, Lee's going to be gone next year. So Yeah, that's a good point. You know what I mean? He If he's, and he can play. So he needs to know that the con, the coach and just the, you know, fans, just everyone in Trojan Nation is behind him and believes that he can be out there because he's going to, we're going to need him to be out there. And uh, just you never want a player's confidence to get shaken. So yeah. now that he's been out there, he knows that he belongs. Now that I feel like that's when things get hairy when you're in the, the snap count competitions mm -hmm. and things like that. Because it's different when you're telling the guy, "Oh, we're gonna play this guy," you know, give him the snaps, and you don't really know what you'll do out there because you haven't been given an opportunity yet. But then once you get out there. And you like, hold on. Like, you wait, put it on tape. You put it on tape, and then you're not getting no snaps. Then that's when, you know, things can get hairy. But I don't see Coach Riley as that type of guy. If you no. go out there, he puts the best player out there, they're going to play. So I expect to see his snaps go up for sure. Rama had a question based on the fact that USC's offense has been doing so well. He said, what, if any, concerns should we have with offense, given just how perfect they have played? <laughs> if Caleb gets hurt. That's Goodness, it. don't put that out there, Dion. I'm not gonna look, <laughs> but I, I say that to say I like Miller Moss. Yeah. He, I feel like he's another guy. Thankfully, he's Trojan. It's Cardinal Gold through and through. But he's definitely a guy I feel like that has the ability to be out there on Saturdays. He can go to San Jose State easy. Go to a, a Oregon State, even like a Utah. I feel like he could play at this level. Yeah. He has the ability. He could sling it. He's athletic. So... I, I like that that we're up early in these games and he's able to get out there get out there and get some meaningful snaps because you just never know. Like maybe and we in the Pac-12 championship, maybe if we had Miller Moss and he was confident, you know what I mean? That's a good point. He's able to bring that dynamic that Caleb couldn't bring because he was hurt. Yeah. You know, and it's a different so just or, you know, we can have a Jalen and Tua situation. You know what I mean? If Miller Moss is as confident as Tua, we could be in a, a big game, you get thrown out there. And you believe you can do it. Yeah. That's the hugest part. Like, yeah, it's one thing for the coaches to believe, but it, do you believe? Because you're the one that's doing it. Sure. And like, they're just encouraging you to do it, you know? Yeah. So that's uh, that's the only thing I would say. Like, oh, 
well, if something was to happen to Caleb, hopefully Miller Moss believes like he could still lead the team. Like, cause we're talented enough. I feel like we could sustain that. Yeah. Depending on when it would happen. But yeah. like if this team, I feel like this team, if we take this team and put them in a Pac-12 championship last year, we win it. I yeah, I guarantee mean guarantee it. Like, I mean, especially with the defense. Like front, guarantee it. Like literally guy for guy, you can keep Jordan Addison. You every guy that was that was on that team last year that's not on the team this year. You take offense, defense, and put them in against that same Utah team last year. Like, we have a better team this year is what yeah. I'm getting to. Yes. Like, yes. We're, we're more suited for the bumps in the road on a championship yes. chase. So, yes. like, that's all. We just hope that none of them bumps are too big. Sure. You know? That's a good that's way it. to put it. And, and and you could just feel that from USC's coaches. The yeah. way that they're talking about how they've been, like, kind of strategizing the last two games and, like, mm-hmm. the rotation, they just feel like they have – more talent and competitive depth is what yeah, they said all Yeah, of. definitely. And obviously, if I can see it, I'm not seeing it every day. Sure. I know they see it, and they're way more excited about it than I am because they <laughs> obviously they're going through the through the whole uh, building process of it. So I'm sure they're excited to see their the fruits of their label starting to show. And uh, they definitely, uh, they look like they, they went out there and they pulled a magic trick, pulled a rabbit out the hat again and just turned his roster over and took it even a step further this year. Something I forgot to ask you when we were in the offensive portion was USC's offensive line play. Mm-hmm. What did you think about how they've played the last two games? I think they've done well. See, people, they get it skewed because Caleb, he moves around and things like that. But it's not like he's dropping back and guys are on him immediately. Like, Caleb will sit back there five seconds. And because he wants to find a guy down the field, then he gets to moving around and it seems like, you know, Maybe the old line isn't giving him enough time to really sit back there and just think about what he wants to do. But <laughs> any other quarterback, they drive back there five, six seconds, they, and then they just run, you know. But Caleb is trying to get away from that, so it's putting more pressure on the old line. They're having to block longer, so I don't think that they are take a step back or anything compared to the old line from last year. I feel like they're in a better position this year because they they've been rotating so many guys like they have like since we had the the injury at guard yeah he was rotating with the wyoming tra- transfer uh i forget his name Emmanuel pregnant yeah so he just stepped right in and you know it's still like that cohesiveness is still there yeah it, it's not like they're doing like just complete swaps five and five out you know it's only a couple guys that's really rotating and then they may move guys to different positions because you just always want to be prepared the more you can do the more you know you can keep the same five guys out there they may not be in the same position but that cohesiveness you know talking and with communication no matter where you're lined up as long as that's there you feel like you can kind of get things done so i feel like they uh they're doing well to me it's all new group of guys you know so it's a uh, i feel like they have surpassed what I expected them to be at right now. Caleb is at the opportunity to look like Caleb, you know, yeah. and that's enough in itself. You know, yeah, it ain't like and he's not running. <laughs> yeah. Like he's doing it all with his arm. Like, yeah, he had a big run last week, but I mean, I could have ran that. You could have ran that. Like it wasn't like someone was pressed. He just took a step to the side, huge hole. He took off. It wasn't yeah. like, oh, someone was chasing him. He had to run. So I feel like they've answered the bill and it was a tall task because our old line was great last year. Yeah. Yeah. We had a really good O line, and they really they came out of nowhere because obviously it was the first year, and nobody sure. knew what to expect, and, and they were elite. So the bar was set high, and I feel like they're answering the bill. Like they're not, it's not a step down or a drop off or anything, in my opinion, so far. Yeah, you mentioned it, but Gina Quinones did go down in the first half. Uh, Lincoln Riley didn't really have much of an update after the game. He said, uh, "Fingers crossed," which mm-hmm. usually in coach speak means that there it doesn't mm-hmm. look good. And and Gino did come out in the second half with kind of a, a sleeve, kind of. ACL type brace on mm-hmm. his knee, which is not something you want to see. So, of course, fingers are crossed and, and wish, wishing the best for Gino. Hopefully, it's it's just a scare and not nothing more. But Definitely. we will keep you posted. Uh, we got a question from Samuel who said, "On obvious passing downs, I noticed they take out a defensive tackle and bring in Zion Branch and move a linebacker to the vacated spot along the along the line of scrimmage. Is that a new thing or something Grinch has done in the past? Dion, can you explain the thinking behind this and is it something you liked?" I loved it, which uh, me and Keely was talking about this off camera. <laughs> uh, they they brought out this dime package, was kind of like this cheetah look up front. Where this is what you were mentioning this earlier. Is, yeah, this okay. is what I was talking about earlier. They take the nose tackle out, and they they uh, bring in a six DB, but they move up a linebacker to rush. 
in spot of that nose tackle. So now you take one of the big guys out and you got all speed rush guys out there in the front four, but you're not bringing any extra pressure behind it. So you're you're manning up behind it and the thinking behind it is to get more speed, more cover guys out there because obviously if I got a big 300-pound nose tackle, I'm not really expecting him to win and get a sack. So that's really just make it, taking a guy – out of the pressure really so now you take that guy out who i'm not expecting to win and put a guy in who i think can win and now i don't have to bring that extra fifth guy and i can have everyone else the other what if it's seven guys in coverage you know yeah. whether they man it up all six off is six dbs across the board then one free which is kaylin or uh that's really the thinking behind it, just to, to get more speed out there and more coverage ability to where they don't have to bring an extra guy. They don't have to get exotic, and they can really just let that 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 cheetah group rush, really. And I re I'm, it got me excited because that's what the good thing good teams can do because you, you can be a really good defense and a, a really elite defense where you don't have to blitz to get pressure. Like when you're front four guys or you got whatever four you can get out there can get pressure on the quarterback. Yeah. Because, like, Caleb, only time we see our offense struggle is they rush three and drop eight. You know what I mean? But imagine if every play he was facing, it was at minimum seven guys back there. Like, they never blitzed them. He'd be sitting back there thinking all the time because it would seem like he's seeing so many defenders. Like, it's, especially if they're not playing man and playing zone. Like, where do you go with the ball? So many people back there. It's not yeah. even about getting open and whatnot. It's just it's so many defenders in your, in your line site. So, that's the thinking behind it to really be able to now that they have the guys to do it. We couldn't do that last year. Like, absolutely no way. Like, we put them out there. I mean, maybe Solomon can compliment Thule because Solomon picked it up towards the end of the year, which he's coming out on fire this year, yeah. side note. But uh, so that's another tribute to the coaches going out recruiting, getting guys to, to, to give more exotic looks to where you don't have to – he doesn't have to get as uh, far in his thought process of drawing things up, X's and O's type deal. It's just getting guys in particular positions and then letting their ability take over from there. Like, it ain't nothing – it's not nothing crazy to take a nose tackle out and then put a linebacker. It looks the exact same to the offense. Everybody is lined up the same. You got four down. You got – where it'll be like six across the back, but they'll all be lined up on a man. So if you just put that nose tackle back in there, it will look exactly the same. Just Davis would have been covering somebody. Yeah. So that's really you just taking taking that nose tackle out, giving your linebacker a chance to win, and bringing in another DB. So it's all about matchups and uh, trying to win that rep right there, and that's the thinking behind it. But to your point, Grinch can be more effective this yes, year. Yes, yes. More effective because he, he can do less. He's doing less, and really they can really rep and get good at a few things. You know what I mean? He doesn't really – oh, what schematics do I have to draw up? What scheme? He, they're not trying to win with scheme. Yeah. You know, and I feel like that's where def defensive coordinators can get in trouble. When, when they get trying, too creative. Getting too, too exotic. You got the defenders. They thinking too much. You got them – just moving a lot. You, you're trying to win with scheme when the name of the game is for the Joes to to be the Joes, and you know what I yeah, mean? So it's yeah. all about the guys that you got out there. Yeah. You don't see Alabama or the Georgias, and I just use them as an example. I'm, I don't care about Alabama or Georgia. They're nothing <laughs> special to me, but just in this day and age, sure. you know, they don't go out there and do nothing exotic on defense. They just put four. They got guys. They let them rush. They guys, they guys beat other guys that they didn't want to recruit. You know what I mean? It ain't like they, they're not rushing guys that Georgia was trying to win yeah. to recruit. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they're getting all the guys they want and they're going out there and beating guys that they didn't want. And that's the name of the game in college football. So you're seeing the difference you're seeing from year one to year two is recruiting. It's the guys. It's not that, oh, Grinch just got so much better. It's like last year. They had to work with what they had, so they, they tried to overcome physical deficits, like ability deficits, by schematics. Yeah. You know, a lot of stemming with the D-line, a lot of pre-stat movement, trying to get the offense sneaking, trying to give their guys, get, get them on the edge, give them the opportunity pre-snap to win, whereas just lining guys up and letting them just, like Bear, go out there and just rush a guy, push a guy back three, four yards. Like, yeah. we just didn't have that ability last year, so. Letting your talent be yeah, talented. Yeah, really. That's that, that's what it is. And that's and that, and then you could circle back to Domani, why people are seeing so much of Domani on the island. Cause we just didn't run man like that last year. It was a lot more zone because 
coaches probably did only felt confident in six in black men covering like that. So they wanted to, you know, kind of cover up everything else. So like now we have, they love the front and you can tell cause they're running man behind it. Like, it's not like we're just blitzing a lot. Like they just lining up the front and letting them go. Like if y'all can't cover for two or three seconds, then we're gonna have to get somebody else out there. This is what pretty much it seems like what they're thinking wow. right now. Yeah. But that means that they have confidence in at least Damani's ceiling, let alone what he can do right now. Oh, yeah, yeah. And how could you not? I mean, he was a five-star for a reason. I watched him at Modern Day. Yeah. He can do it. Like, the hurdle for him was just getting hurt. He was a fast guy. He hurt his knee. So it was a confidence thing, you know, getting back, believing he can do what everybody else can can think he do, can think think thinks he could do. But I promise you, if Damani makes two plays, if he picks off the ball he drops in San Jose State, and he uh, uh, makes the play on the deep pass. Bradley breaks it up. He just puts his hands up because he goes like this, like he's the receiver. Like yeah. he, when he turns, he just goes like this. Yeah, like he's not throwing you the ball. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? Like so, it's just minor adjustment. He makes those two plays. People are thinking Demonte's playing lights out. So yeah. What other plays can you pull up against him besides the one bust? But you only know it's a bust because if you know football, it's not like he got beat on a play. So he. Uh, people were, I feel like they ran a little strict, little uh, judgmental on him. Maybe it's because he was a five star and he was this and he was that. And they're expecting him to just, just, just be that without, you know, the building block up to that. Like yeah. nobody just comes in and Deion Sanders, I mean, yeah, he was Deion. So like, but <laughs> generally you go through some, some bumpy roads and then you're that finished product. So right now he's just, he's learning, he's building, but he, uh, the sky's definitely a limit for a guy like that. And I, I feel like the coaches see that, so that's why they're they're putting him out there on the island like that. Because even though they they're confident in the front, they're confident in his ability. Even though he hasn't even been able to show them to give them the reason to be confident, I guess. But just when you know, as a coach, you know. So they know that he's special, and uh, I believe the more opportunities he gets, he'll be able to prove that to the fans. I feel like that settles the five questions we got about Damani Jackson this week. Um, I will ask one from John, though, who said, uh, would Damani make a better free safety? He seems a little stiff in the hips to play press. Um, that's a good question. That's a good question. But I, uh, I think he's still just getting in the flow of it. Like, it's such a mental thing being out there on that island. I can't imagine. Like, it's such a mental thing. And you know the world is watching like it you can't hide it like if i mess up everyone's gonna see like even if i don't mess up and it look like i mess up everyone's gonna think i messed up so you know like it's not a fun life for it's corners. not it's not a fun <laughs> life if you're not if you're not about being on that island it's really it takes a different personality a different skill set to be out there and be confident every snap like i don't know what this guy is doing but i'm confident i'm so confident in my ability that i can react to what you already know you can do it better than what you can do, like, just knowing what you're going to do. So, like, you know you're running out. I feel like I can react quicker to that out than you just running out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that. just the mindset of that is just crazy. Like, you got to be a different type of person to be out there. But he has that the ability to even have that mindset but then go out there and back it up. Like, he, So once he just puts it all together because he really is gifted. He yeah. Physically, like, and just ability-wise, he can move. It seems like he's stiff because he's big. Mm. He's not like, when I say big, solid. Like, he's not like a slinky guy. You know what yeah. I mean? So you can't, he doesn't look as fluid as he really is. Because if you watch the, the tape, he's in position every time. Like, he's always right there. It's not like no one's just ran past him or he just, I don't know, got double moved or whatever, got routed and he just wasn't in the picture. Like, he's always there. Like, whether he makes the play or don't make the play has been the, the issue for Domani and like I've, he's making more plays he, as the games go on so it's correctable it's correctable it's correctable and once he corrects it he's going to be one of the best corners in the country so you heard it here yeah, definitely Dion said the, it the ability he has can't coach it we got a question from R. Milo who said, what's your overall projection on freshmen like Braylon Shelby, Sam Green, Elijah Hughes? Looks like the making of a potentially special D-line unit, plus fellow freshmen like David Peavy and Dijon Lafayette uh, waiting for their turn. Lots of talents, talent for Coach Nua to work slash mold with. I project them to, uh, to do a lot of special things in the future, especially um, Elijah. He's been in there in the thick of the rotation, and he's looked great. He doesn't look like a freshman. He looks like he's belongs. And uh, what I saw from uh, Shelby coming out late, 
I mean, he looked like like he's a dude too. Like he looked generally when freshmen aren't out there, it's because of the physical. Like they still need to build the body. Mm-hmm. It, it may is way is not as focused on their phys- football ability, but more so just their physical makeup. And uh, they look like they brought in guys that were ready now, or I don't know if they they may not have been ready when they came in in the summer, but right now on the field they look ready. So all that means is that they're building a a, a sustainable program. Like it's not a lightning in a bottle type program. Like they they're building this for the long haul. They're gonna have guys after guys after guys just waves of players coming through whether it's guys they recruit and they build up the guys that believe in what coach riley and the staff are preaching and they stick around even if it's not their time when they feel like they're ready or they hit home runs in the transfer portal which i mean year two i believe is something they can sustainably do year in and year out like i've seen it two years in a row which is crazy which is crazy but i i they figured out this free agency thing and they uh so I feel like they're they're in the new age of college football. They're uh, building a sustainable program, and young D linemen uh, like Shelby and uh, Elijah are going to be the, uh, the really the foundation of that because it's going to be guys who flash early but stick around, you know. Yeah. So and that's all about the culture. Like you don't see a lot of guys transferring out of culturally proven programs, like. Bears is a, a slight example because yeah. I mean he was I can see it like he should have been out there like he should have is some guys I, you gotta excuse the traditional you know wait your turn type thing you put them out there <laughs> hey hey you get out there you know we got fine snaps for you it don't matter because uh can't hold guys back but the culture uh just the the, the building of a, a championship culture i feel like that's what they're doing here and that's why you're seeing guys come in in the fourth quarter and you're like wait that guy looks like he should be playing or like how come he isn't playing well just like hey we got five six guys look just like him in front of him and, you know yeah. so it's a it's a good thing to see when you when you got guys like true freshmen and people asking questions about true freshmen like yeah and we're winning you know it's not like we're losing you're like hey how come we're not playing this guy put that guy out there he could do more like hey, yeah so it's a good it's a good situation the program is in right now and uh the way the freshmen are looking and producing it looks like they're they're building for for a sustainable future. Alex wanted to know your thoughts on the other Dion, your thoughts on Colorado against TCU. Oh man, I'm uh that's the only other team I'm rooting for apparently. <laughs> just I hope they do great every week besides when they play SC, but it's just a testament to just for me personally, like going against just the traditional way of thinking, just traditional. Like me, I made the jump into the corporate world, and obviously I'm not, not obviously, but I'm not the typical corporate like employee. Sure. You know, so like, and I don't approach it that way either. Like I don't try and fit into that mold, and that's pretty much what Dion's doing. And it's just a, a exclamation behind the thought that you is not a like one way to do something. Like it's as long as you can do the job. Is multiple ways to get the job done, and uh, in some ways, is maybe Nick Saban is effective for some people, but the Deion Sanders way can work too. Like it's not we gotta have one or the other, you know. So I'm excited to see him make that jump, especially him being a former player. Like I'm so for former players getting into coaching because we've been through those experiences. It's different when you're a coach and you're trying, you're telling a player like how they should live, like what they need to do, but they never were like that in your position. You know, yeah. like Dion, there's no one that can be in any position that Dion hasn't been in as a player. Yeah. You know, so like ha- imagine having that as your, your head man. Like I can go to him with anything, like whether it's about family, especially for a lot of guys that come from the same background as him, whether about family or aspirations to make it to the next level or potentially become a gold jacket type guy so like anywhere in it's, between it's super it's super cool like just to to see how the traditional just way of doing things could be broken and it's good to see that they're having success again i want them to have success every game but usc i hope <laughs> we stick it to them out there in boulder this year but it's, it's good especially for what's the coolest part about it is he's doing it with his son his sons yeah. Yeah, like, and that's so cool. Like yeah. that, if it was just him, I don't know if I would feel the same as sure. strongly about it. But sure. like the way he's moved, like his whole thing has been about his family. He's taking this no matter. And you, as a player, a coach's son, like that stigma is just you know oh, just because your daddy. You know, you're only <laughs> playing because your daddy. But like, yeah. I was so juiced to see how Shador played because it's like 
he finally then got out that stigma. Like all while he was at Jackson State, all throughout the little truth high school, all throughout his pop one, it's all just oh your daddy, that's why you're the quarterback, that's why you're playing, your daddy's the coach and this and that. And then he went out there, first opportunity, and I can only imagine the feeling for Dion. Like he was probably like, you know, like, cause it's just like I've known this whole time that he had it in him, but like yeah. nobody believed me now the world can see. Like I mean, he said as much after the game. Yeah, that's why that's, <laughs> I guarantee that's why he's so emotional, because it's his son leading of course. that charge. Like, that's so cool. Like, that's it's so cool that he's doing it with his family. He ain't just jump ship or like leave nobody behind. Like he took everybody with him that wanted to come from Jackson State. It was like we all taking a step up. Like, I'm not just trying to like, you know, I've seen a lot of it in a power five, especially a guy go through the whole season and bounce before the bowl game's even over. You yeah. know what I mean? A lot of weird stuff that I don't feel like I feel like he's a genuine dude and people are just seeing it. Like he's out there, he's like a like a player just be in a coach's hat. Like he that's he's just still like a player and it's just it's so it's so cool and I hope him and his family they have a lot of success and uh, Shador is able to, you know, make follow his dad's footsteps because you know prime really has opened the door and given him the opportunity and put him under a micro a light bright light so yeah. like his family and just oh man it's so cool man i can't wait for a documentary to come out about <laughs> them like he's gonna have a killer documentary i'm yeah. sure like give him five ten years however long he wants to coach or enough to like build a coaching resume behind his player resume and uh man just super cool to see super cool and a lot of people trying to discredit it because of the, all the turnover and everything in college football is like oh that's last year's tcu team that's this year well you can say same thing about our team you know what i mean like our defense really like a lot of teams in co college football nowadays one team from year to year is not going to be roster the same. Is, yeah yeah it's like the nfl now for real like <laughs> that roster it could be completely different year to year like you literally might only have like star players that return yeah but everything else is different so it was a big win for them i'm excited to see how they progress and like was it just you know like one win or are they gonna be able to build are they i'm ex the the pac-12 is crazy this is the last year of the pac-12 and i feel like it's we it's so unfortunate oh my they blew it yeah the powers that be i mean they it, and it took a while for the conference to build back yeah to where we the depth is there yeah you know we was real top heavy for a couple of years yeah but the depth is is looking like it's it's so many guys like it's guys that people aren't even talking about that are gonna like get their name called on draft day like the quarterback at Arizona or like it's just, it's, it's so many guys like yeah. it's so the quality is 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 there in the conference now and there a lot of the guys are young like Caleb and Bo and well it's like three quarterbacks that are like the only stars that are gonna be leaving the conference everybody else is young coming back it's like, wild it's, but it's unfortunate it's so unfortunate because of the west coast you know like we you know we have our pac 12 after dark and all that like yeah. we have and that's just gonna be gone like it's gone like there's no more west coast football really it's sad it's sad it is sad it is sad like my son will never know like the pac 12 like he will never know it I grew up in the Pac-10, <laughs> which man. was not. I know it was like the Pac-8 and all that, man. but that was my thing. Man, nah, me too. Yeah, so it's uh, it's gonna be different, but hey, at least we can go out with a bang this year. Like yeah. it seems like it's gonna be a lot of great games this year. A lot of teams look like they're they're coming ready to play. Rosters look good. So if this is the year where I mean, it's gonna be the hardest year to run a gauntlet for sure. Yeah, I mean, while we were recording this. Oregon State beat San Jose State forty-two to seventeen. So the Pac-12 is undefeated. Yeah, and I mean, which again, <laughs> that, man, like, and none of us had to play each other. So like, we beat other conferences like every and yeah, it's 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 sad. It's sad that it's we really probably got the deepest year, deepest like team wise and just really talent wise either like yeah. we're gonna have a lot of guys names called next it's, year it's exciting across the board like across usually like board. you said it's top heavy usually it's like the u.s season whatever mm -hmm. it's across the must board. see tv yeah i want to watch every pac-12 team play and I, when have we ever said never that? <laughs> never i haven't i don't remember last time i watched colorado play <laughs> i remember i watched last time i watched like washington state play besides when they play sc sure or like a oregon state besides when they yeah. play sc but like they come. I want to see. I yeah. want to see. They got a lot of new guys, a lot of transfers coming in, whatnot, and they're getting good guys from other schools. And what I've seen from the transfer portal, 
it ain't it's really proven that it's not always the guy it's not always the player sometimes it is the, the system or the the coach leading that player like because you've seen guys transfer and blow up blossom in their new uh with their new team in the new system so it's exciting it's a great i don't know if there's ever been a year especially at the quarterback position that looks like this year for the pack like, yeah we may have like excluding drake may like the first if every quarterback in this conference entered the draft next year we would potentially have like the first six pick six quarterbacks taken if you exclude the north carolina quarterback wow yeah like bo the washington quarterback Penix, obviously caleb what year is Penix? he's he him and bo is like their last year they can't come back okay yeah they're like super seniors okay yeah caleb's the only one that could come back in Lord knows, we're all <laughs> we're all asking for a miracle. <laughs> we're all True. asking for a miracle, but uh, it's exciting. I don't, I've never seen any, not even just the pack, any conference so where like is this because it's all about your quarterback play that makes a collegiate team elite or the chance to be elite. Yeah. So that's why I say I think we're the cream of crop this year because we it's so many good quarterbacks. They have so many teams that have the opportunity to be good because they have a good guy at the helm leading the way. So it's gonna be exciting and. Uh, we better buckle up for the ride because it's going to be a lot more interesting this year than it was last year. Definitely, for sure. Already the final question comes from actually Cody's mom, Christy <laughs> Kessler, who said, now for the important stuff, when is Trojan baby Bailey, number three, going to be here? Love your sweet little family. <laughs> Side note, hey, Miss Kessler. <laughs> <laughs> uh, baby number three is due in October. So uh, the third and final baby. <laughs> yeah, third and final, our baby girl will be here in October. So... Our family will be complete in a couple of weeks, and uh, it's an exciting time, definitely, in the Bailey household. Very exciting. Your second son was also due in October, right? He was doing no. He was doing October, but he came in November. Okay. Yeah. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to remember our podcasting schedule. That's yeah. what I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was pretty close. Like he was born in October, uh, November 5th. So it's okay. Real close. Okay. Yeah. I just remember you still trying to podcast, and I was like, Dion, <laughs> be the father. It's totally fine. Dedication. Yeah. So much dedication. It is appreciated. And I just had to say, uh, it was so funny, uh, Cody. We were all together at the Coliseum on mm -hmm. Saturday, kind of reunited, and. I was taking a picture for your family and Cody, uh, your one of your sons wasn't looking the right direction. Cody, without even being asked, came behind me and was like making all these weird faces <laughs> so your son would look at the camera. And I was like, we are such a tag team podcasting trio. I <laughs> just had be. to say. <laughs> Gotta be. Gotta Alrighty. Be. Any final thoughts, DM, before we wrap this one up? Like I said, so excited that you were in the podcast uh, studio for this one. It was so nice to see you in 3D, not have a delay, actually Definitely. have a back and forth conversation. But any final thoughts? Definitely. Super cool to, to get the real studio experience, real podcast experience, and uh, bring that to you guys. Uh, <laughs> technical issue free this week. Hey, <laughs> fingers crossed. We still haven't uh, finished this, you, Dion. You are so right. We have not uh, you know, <laughs> edited and all that yet, yes. so let me not jinx us. But, uh, yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, final thoughts this week is, uh, hey, we came out uh, for the most part unscathed. We did have one injury, and uh, it was a dominating victory. Everybody looked good, got a lot of rotation, a lot of guys got reps. So it's uh, I would say it was a positive week, and uh, next week we head into, you know, what has become, like, I don't know if it's like a rivalry, but it's become like a thing Te playing Technically, Stanford. USC's oldest rival. Technically, really? yes. Really? I yes. did not know that. But uh, I know ever since Harbaugh got into Stanford, it's become like a thing playing them now. So yeah. we're buckling up for what could potentially be, you know, a big week this week. And uh, so it's exciting uh, for the guys to potentially be playing in a, a big game to for the first big game, really, for the yeah. season. And uh, hopefully, you know, you guys show up and show out for uh, the Pac-12 opener, the final Pac-12 opener for Wild. the year. Man. Is that I, insane? It's just wild to say. Like, it, I guess this is the last time it'll be a thing playing Stanford for a while. So I guess every Pac-12 game is a big game this year. Yeah. I mean, Lincoln Riley said as much in his press conference uh, on Saturday. He basically had, like, a PSA. He was like, this is the last Stanford matchup for the foreseeable future. Like, come to the Coliseum, pack it out. Like, this is, we're yeah, in the... This is it. Yeah. Which is, is insane to, to think about. So... Right. Hopefully we, we you know, we we take take that seriously and really just get, show up and enjoy this the sight of seeing the trojans take on all our practical opponents for the yeah. last time this year yeah. and we get that first opportunity this week 
I know I'll be back at home in Nashville. I'll be tuned in, though. Maybe a little emotional. You know, I always had a, a tie to Stanford. I feel like my best collegiate games came against Stanford. And uh, so, which in my day 10 years ago, they were an elite team, and it was always a huge game we played Stanford. So it was, it was a huge thing for me to show up on the big stage against a great opponent. So hopefully that's the stage that the boys are on this weekend, and they show up and show out, and we get this last Pac-12 journey kicked off on the right foot. And uh, enjoy the ride. Yep. All righty, Dion. Safe travels back home. I wish you could stay Thank out you. here for the whole season, but I guess you got to go home. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, that's going to wrap it up. We'll be back with a preview episode on Wednesday, so stay tuned for that. But that's Dion. I'm Keely. We'll see you all next time.